Hi, this is Chris Campbell, and welcome to the Food Institute Podcast. This week, we welcome back Bill Bishop, Chief Architect of Brick Meets Click, and we're going to be speaking about the current state of the grocery commerce space and where it could be headed. But first, whether you are a first-time listener or becoming something of a regular, we ask that you share this episode on your social media platforms. It helps us expand our reach, and we really appreciate it when you do so. And I should note that we're now available on Spotify and Apple iTunes, so you can look for us there if those are your platforms of choice. So with that all said... I'll introduce Bill and start off by asking him how he's doing today. So how are you, Bill? Chris, I'm doing just fine and uh, really good to connect with you. Well, we're really glad to have you back on the show, Bill. I was wondering, for those who may not have listened to the first episode, do you think you'd give a brief background about yourself and also Brick Meets Click? Well, I'm a longtime industry consultant, uh, having formed uh, Willard Bishop Consulting in the late 70s uh, and then Brick Meets Click in 2011. Um, I was probably getting ready for retirement about that time, but when I saw all the excitement around digital, I had to jump into that area, and so we picked up the domains for Brick Meets Click, uh, and we've been happily working in that space ever since. So um, we spend a lot of time focused on the digital transformation in grocery, and I'm glad to share any thoughts and observations we can with the audience today. And that's perfect, Bill. And the last time we spoke, it was April in 2020. And now that we're in December 2020, it seems like it's shut down season again, like every time we speak, Bill. But I do think it's a good time to take a peek at what grocery e-commerce has been doing throughout 2020. So what's the latest news you can tell us? Well, we finished a uh, uh, our most recent consumer research at the middle of November. And what that showed us was that the total, and this is the total online grocery shopping uh, in November, was a little over $8 billion for the month. Now, that's exactly the same number that we had in August of 2020. So that number held from August to November. And I um, uh, want to mention that what, what's in that number is pickup, delivery, and what we call ship to home, which would be the, the uh, uh, products that are ordered from a central website and then usually shipped by a third party, a common, common carrier. Um, and we try to maintain very strict definitions of those three categories and the totals, so we'll be able to maintain an apple-to-apple -apple comparison over time. Uh, What's interesting, though, in the period from August to November of uh, uh, 2020 is the, the pickup and delivery sales portion expanded and the uh, ship to home actually decreased modestly. So we're seeing the total sustained. We're seeing a shift in the direction of pickup and delivery, which is basically where mo most retailers play. What do you think is causing that dynamic? Well, I think the, uh, the retailers broadly have responded with uh, more service and more retailers who hadn't previously been offering online uh, uh, have jumped into the, into the fray. So I think grocers who, have, who had been a little more reluctant to promote uh, online sales got very aggressive and, uh, uh, and that's showing in the strength of what's happened here in the latter part of 2020. So in reading that report, one of the things that really stuck out to me was that we have this $8 billion trend that's basically been happening since May, I believe, if I uh, read the report correctly. So I think it would be a good point of reference just to know what kind of monthly sales were we looking at in 2019 during that August to November uh, period that you were speaking about? Well, you know, it's amazing, but we were doing about two billion a month in August 19. So as you say today, and for the most recent past, we've been doing eight billion a month. So we've basically had a, a four times increase in online sales since the pandemic, a huge increase. 
Absolutely huge. And I think obviously the trend has kind of established itself that as the pandemic is going on, especially in the winter months, I think it's safe to expect that we'll have this $8 billion number likely in the coming months. But do you think that this trend continues into 2021, specifically when a vaccine gets developed uh, and, you know, the world starts to reopen uh, to some extent? I personally think, and I, and I guess I may be a little biased, this is what we focus on, but I think the trend is going to continue. And, and here's why. First of all, uh, in November, we had almost 40 million people who had bought online grocery with pickup and delivery. Now, that's just pickup and delivery in the previous month. So you've got a very strong core of shoppers, uh, 40 million of them, uh, who are actively online already. And what's interesting is that in the period from just uh, September, uh, August through November, we wound up with an increase of more than 3 million additional online grocery orders. So uh, you can feel underneath that total a shifting and a building, particularly from the standpoint of pickup and delivery. So on the delivery front, I know that there's been a lot of news, at least in the food service sector, about third-party companies coming in. DoorDash with the IPO is one of them and sort of handling this delivery aspect for the food service industry. On the retail side, we do have operators like Shipt and Instacart, but I'm wondering, is delivery becoming more of an avenue for retailers themselves to kind of get a hold on? Is that a process that they like to own or are you seeing that there's more, uh, you know, partnership with these third party companies to offer that service now that we are, you know, nine months into this pandemic. Most retailers still have a fairly strong dependency on third party providers, but most of the energy is focused on switching to first party, which is a fancy way of saying the grocer is going to be responsible. So we see uh, a lot of motivation on the part of grocers to take greater control of, of the delivery process. Uh, part of it has to do with kind of owning the brand, owning the experience. Uh, but I think just below that and of tremendous importance is reducing costs. I mean, what we see today is delivery costs with third party providers running 10 to $12 uh, per delivery. Uh, in many instances, the grocers are not only subsidizing the sort of assembly of the order, but they're also subsidizing some of the cost of that delivery, and that's just not sustainable. So that's one of the reasons they're trying to take greater control. So if you were a grocer currently partnered with these third-party delivery services, what would your course of action be? Is this an opportunity for you to break away and kind of create your own private in-house delivery systems? And is there an opportunity for third-party delivery services right now to also kind of make some headway, perhaps by lowering service charges or working on a better way to brand it with those grocers? What do you think the landscape is going to look like in the coming years? Well, it's hard to know how much negotiating room the third parties have. So let me concentrate first on uh, what the retailers that I think the leading retailers are doing, they're basically taking control of uh, a fraction of their deliveries. And what, what they're essentially doing is saying, um, you, man, you third party folks are great at managing gig work. We're going to take responsibility to manage the gig work of delivery. And in so doing, we're going to reduce our costs. Now, what's interesting is that not only do they kind of eliminate the margins of the third parties at this point, but actually because of the software that's available, the management of the gig delivery process is a relatively low cost activity. So when they start assuming that responsibility, they're not assuming a big cost, they're assuming a smaller cost, assuming basically they use some good scheduling software. So I, I think you'll find numerous examples of the retailers getting the software and then setting up their own delivery uh, processes, 
uh, contracting with their, their own uh, immediate delivery resources, and um, in some instances, actually setting up little marketplaces just like the uh, uh, third parties do where individuals could be bidding for that work. So there's going to be a lot going on in that area. What that says, though, Chris, is that as, those, uh, as that competition increases, the, uh, the third parties are going to have to do something to sustain themselves. So we just don't know what yet. So while the rest of the retail world adapted to the online space earlier than grocery, and I think grocery was somewhat notoriously resistant to being digitized because of consumer demand uh, for being able to pick out their own produce or meats, and also some of the cold chain logistical issues that come inherent with trying to transport cold goods, it does really seem that consumer demand has shifted drastically because of COVID-19. So I'm wondering if you could give us an overview of basically how these different forces converge to end up in the space that we're in right now. Well, I'm glad you said different forces converge because it, it's certainly a mix of influences that got us to where we are today. But I think the main influence has been the consumer. The consumer has pulled the retail grocers very quickly into the online mode. And they've done that because there's really tremendous advantage to many of them in shifting online. Uh, they're going to save time. Uh, they're going to uh, protect themselves from uh, the possibility of uh, contracting COVID. And many of them have found that the retailers are doing a really good job of selecting some of the perishable products uh, that otherwise they would typically not want to delegate to the retailer. I mean, really, when you look at it, the instructions for the professional shoppers uh, working for many retailers is pick the best so we don't have a complaint. So um, people have been satisfied in that regard. And uh, that's that's been the main thing that's pulled things along. Uh, you know, the thing that limited us was capacity. Uh, but we've caught up. So hearing about these consumer changes, I think grocery retail is also in an interesting space. And talking to food service operators and other that's, others that work in that part of the industry, you know, there's this belief that online delivery will remain, but, you know, people are pent up and really want to be able to go out to their restaurant as soon as they can once the world's reopened. Grocery stores are not in the same space as, you know, they're pretty much been universally declared as essential and people have been able to visit throughout all the, uh, throughout the entire pandemic. So I'm wondering, you know, how sticky are these changes? We spoke about it a little bit earlier, but do you really imagine that we're going to see 8 billion in online sales in next July, say when the vaccines developed, or do you think that this will modulate a little bit or moderate a little bit before then? Do you think that, you know, the consumer demand is just there and that this will continue to grow? I'm interested to see what your prospectus is going into 2021 and beyond. I do think that demand is there and will continue to grow. At the same time, all of us are getting itchy, of course, to go out and get a restaurant meal, to socialize and to enjoy that. So the food service people aren't wrong in any sense in saying that there's going to be some additional movement to uh, to eating, to returning to eating out uh, to a degree. But uh, the habit of eating at home, I think, has been very well established. People have kind of relearned how to do that, how to prepare meals, uh, maybe some of the social aspects of that. So uh, we are definitely expecting that uh, the grocery sales are going to uh, maintain at a fairly strong level and a, and a growing level in terms of online purchases. Um uh, uh, right through 2021 and, and beyond, um, there's just too much advantage to the consumer in being able to order online and either pick up or even preferred have it be delivered. Uh, it's just a, a big convenience if they don't have time to uh, stop at the store. So now that we're nearing the end of 2020, how would you rate grocery retailers' digital efforts during the pandemic year? If you had to give them a grade, what would you say uh, was their response to really unprecedented and very challenging times? Well, let's uh, let's grade them uh, 
in a half year and total year uh, dimension. In, in the first half of the academic, I, I think you'd have to give grocery retailers a C to C plus. We weren't prepared. Uh, there were a lot of disappointments, a lot of mistakes, a lot of stress, a lot of strain. Uh, if we move to the second half of the year and kind of take the weight for the whole year, I think we can give them a strong B because they've made up the capacity. They now have the capacity. They're delivering uh, on time with accurate orders. They've refined their processes. And now they're concentrating on trying to figure out how to do it profitably. So I think a solid B for the year, beginning a bit lower, just because uh, it, it came as a surprise. And, you know, who wasn't surprised by the pandemic? I definitely agree with that. You know, it was unprecedented. But I guess that also brings up the question of how prepared were they? Uh, and was this mostly them adapting on the fly or were they able to just mobilize some of the some of the strategics that they had already put together ahead of time? You know, what kind of balance was there there? Is this something that they had to respond to completely or is this something they could have been better prepared for? I don't think there's any question that they couldn't they could have been better prepared. And part of the reason, I think, is that um with the level of online shopping prior to the pandemic, it was hard for them to justify the spend to get ready. I mean, it's sort of like a little of the second guessing that's going on in so many dimensions today. How do you prepare for something that might happen, but you don't, you're not sure is going to happen? And a lot of grocers were, in, were caught in that category in the early months. Uh, so... Uh, there was a tremendous amount of catch up on the fly, to your point, use your, your terminology. And uh, the, the platforms, uh, the online platforms uh, worked very hard to help the retailers get ready. The retailers worked hard to get ready. There are other service providers that jumped in and assisted. So uh, it was a team effort, uh, but it was pretty much on the fly. And I think it went from a situation where... Uh, I'd, I'd say really the majority of grocers are going, well, you know, maybe we have to do this to, you know what, we really have to do this. And that's the transition we went through, Chris. So looking again to 2021, what can grocery retailers do to garner new customers for their e-commerce platforms? And what can they do to kind of re-entrench their existing e-commerce customers on the platform as, you know, the current crisis comes to an end? Well, I think some of the ways they can attract new customers are, uh, are to work on reducing the cost of delivery. And we talked a little bit about that. Uh, truth of the matter is that uh, a lot of customers would prefer delivery over pickup if it didn't cost them a significant premium. So number one is reducing the cost of delivery. I think uh, another area that's a little bit more challenging, but nonetheless, it's what we're going to see in 2021, is retailers truly helping consumers answer questions that they're still not uh, finding it easy to answer. Things like, uh, you know, what are we going to have for dinner based on what we've bought recently and what we have on hand? Uh, that seems like such a simple thing, but it's emotionally laden and it's the kind of thing that a lot of people struggle with and as a consequence have a very limited repertoire of meals. So I'm anticipating and we're in fact seeing signs that grocers are going to do more to inspire new food choices. There's going to be some smart uh, recommendations that help in this regard. And it's going to be kind of the softer side of helping the uh, meal preparer uh, get on with that job. Um, also, I think uh, we are going to see a situation where, and now this is both uh, the uh, acquisition and the retention, um, I think we're going to see a significant focus on improving the efficiency of the tools we have to both acquire and retain customers. There's a small number of grocers out there today 
who have figured out how to crack the code, that is how to, how to attract and retain customers without spending an arm and a leg. And that skill is something that I expect that many additional retailers will acquire in the next 12 to 18 months. So I think that's as good a place as any to wrap it up for the day. Um, I want to thank you again for your time today, Bill. Where can our listeners go to learn more about you and Brick Meets Click? Well, uh, if they just go to uh, uh, brickmeetsclick.com, uh, they'll find um, a post every week. We have a regular newsletter we invite people to sign up for. And most importantly, I think our... Uh, our data, and that's right up on the site right now at uh, Brick Meets Click, um, is uh, as solid uh, and as accurate and as consistent a base of information as as they would want. If they if they need that kind of uh, bedrock information, uh, come to Brick Meets Click or give me a buzz, or you can email me at bill.bishop at Brick Meets Click. And Chris, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you again. As always, Bill, it's always a pleasure. And I want to reiterate that Brick Meets Click data has been a great source of information for the Food Institute over the years as well. So we thank you on this side for helping us out. And like I said, we'll definitely share the relevant links in the description of this episode. So remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share. If you'd like to learn more about the Food Institute, please take a look at the links in the description to learn more about us and what membership could do for you and your company. So until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off. Music